I've entitled this lecture Winter Study. And I've entitled it as such because well, what I'd like to speak about is, is especially some of the methods that we use to collect the data on Isle Royal. Just understanding the methods we use to collect data goes a long ways towards understanding the purpose of the project and what some of the answers have been to some of the questions that we ask about the wolves and moose on Isle Royal. Now, the, the wolf and moose project on Isle Royal has two field seasons, a winter field season and a summer field season. Some of the most critical things that we learn come from the winter, and the, for that reason, I want to focus on just that. What's important about winter study is that it's been conducted every year using basically the same methods since the year 1959, January of 1959. For more than five decades, we've been counting the wolves and moose that live on that island. And uh, what I'd like to do is start off by just telling you how it is that we count the wolves. The thing about wolves is that we, we, we take advantage of quite a bit of their behaviors to help us understand uh, how, how to count them. The first thing that we know is that in a typical year, the population of wolves is divided up into three packs. And this map here shows that you know, one of the packs generally lives in, in this area, one of the packs generally lives in this area, and one of the packs generally lives in this area. So one of the things that that means is that when we're flying around in a small aircraft, which is how it is that we make our observations, I'll say more about the flying in just a minute, when we're flying around and we see some wolves, based on where we are on the island, we know which pack it is that we're looking at based on this kind of history and, and tradition of where the packs tend to live. The other thing to, to appreciate about, uh, about counting wolves is, is, to, is to think a little bit about this picture right here that shows um, you know, what the landscape of Isle Royal looks like when looked at from an airplane. It's a heavily forested island, so seeing the ground is difficult. You mostly see the treetops. You have to look careful to see in between the treetops to see the ground. So one of the things that really greatly helps us find wolves is that in the wintertime, they're pretty fond of walking across frozen lakes. It's just an easy place for them to, to walk. And so the image of these wolves that we see walking across a lake um, that's how it is that we often see or discover the wolves. If we don't see the wolves themselves, then what we do is we see their tracks across these frozen lakes. And when we see those tracks, we follow them backwards. Or, I'm sorry, we follow them forward. We follow them forward until we catch up with the wolves and then can actually see them. And basically what we do after that, it's not real difficult. We just count the wolves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten wolves. So what we do with the wolves on Isle Royale is we attempt to count every single one of them. And basically the way it is that we're able to do that is by flying every single day that the weather permits us to do so for about a seven week period. And by flying so frequently when we find the pack of wolves, for sure, maybe on that day not every wolf in the pack is present. Maybe the pack size is eight but we only see six there that particular moment. But by seeing them repeatedly day after day, we eventually get a sense of, aha, this pack has seven wolves in it or eight or whatever the case may be, and this other pack has five wolves or whatever. After we figure out the pack size for each of the wolves, then the challenging thing is to find out the lone wolves, the wolves that are not associated with any particular pack. That basically just takes a, a quite a bit of diligence looking for the tracks of individual wolves in the snow and we, when we see such tracks, following them until we can confirm that they end up in, with a wolf and to confirm that that wolf doesn't belong to one, any of the other packs. So, so basically, to kind of give you a, a little bit of a sense of things, Here's a sheet from uh, one of our data books that we, uh, that we write in during the winter time. And if we zoom in on, on one part of this, you know what we have here is it's, it's real simple stuff. And I just, just, the intention is to illustrate that sort of thing. Every day that we fly, we have an entry. And so the first column just says the date for flying. This is information from the year 2008. And so the first entry is for January 18th. The second entry is how many wolves did we see? on that particular day, any information about those wolves, mainly what pack does that wolf belong to. So on the 18th, we saw a one wolf, and we were not sure what pack it belonged to. Where did we see it? We saw it on, 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 uh, on Beaver Island, and it walked to the main island. What was it doing? It was trotting, basic behavior. And then who saw it? The two observers are either myself or Rolf Peterson, so the, the initials of the person that saw it. And we can see, you know, the 18th wasn't a very informative day, but on the 20th, 
We saw uh, Middle Pack Wolves, MP. There were five wolves there. We saw Chippewa Harbor Pack, but we were unsure how many wolves were there, basically because either maybe it was just a, a radio collared wolves and we only heard of the radio telemetry signal but didn't actually see the wolves. Maybe the wolves were in thick cover, and so we saw one or two wolves, but we're pretty sure there were more there, so we just write down a question mark. Anyways, by taking this data and then uh, being able to just kind of take into account day after day after day, and you know we would have several pages of information like this. Um, you know we can get a sense for how many wolves are on the island, usually pretty precisely. I had mentioned that most of this work is done from an airplane, and so this is the airplane that that we use. We call it the the Cub. It's a it's a Piper Super Cub is a, is the name of the plane. Uh, it's a very small little plane. This, plane or this picture gives you a sense of this. In the front is, is our pilot, Don Glazer. In the back is Rolf Peterson. He's a colleague that I work with, and uh, he and I, he or I sits in the back seat there. And then uh, Glazer, our pilot, is always flying. So the, the width of the fuselage is, is only a little bit wider than your hips. And the, fa and, the, and, the, and the side of the fuselage is made of basically fabric. If you push on the side, it, it flexes in and out. It's, it's in some ways, it's... it's uh, it's like gliding, gliding as much as it is, as it is like flying. This is a view uh, of, of what it is that I see when I'm sitting in the back seat. If I look forward, I see the, the back of, of, of Donnie, our pilot, and I can see very easily out the left or right-hand side of the plane. You may have noticed in the previous picture that the wing is above the fuselage, so when I look right out the windows, the wings don't obstruct that at all, and you get really a, a, a really great, great view out the window. I'll show you some of those views in just a minute. I want to shift now to counting moose. Counting wolves is something that we can do. Uh, uh, you can, we can count every single one of them because on average there's only about a couple of dozen wolves, so to count them all is, is, is a feasible activity. On average, there are about a 1,000 moose. There's not enough time in the winter to count them all. And so what we do is we sample the island by counting how many moose are in portions of the island and then extrapolate from there. This map of Isle Royal shows the locations of the plots that we use year after year to count the moose. There are 91 of these plots. Each plot is one square kilometer in size. And it represents about 15% of the area of Isle Royal. The moose that we see on these plots is extrapolated to the rest of the island. And here's basically how that extrapolation goes. Again, this is a real data from Isle Royal. And what we see on this map are each one of these plots. And filled in in each one of these plots is the number of moose that we see. This uh, data comes from uh, the year 2004. This is a period of time when there are relatively few moose, but it is typical of at least how things have been for the last 10 years or so. You can see that many of the entries are zeros. Uh, no moose at all are seen on the plots. There are a number of plots with just one moose observed and then a handful of plots where two moose were observed. And in this particular year, only, let's see, I only see a couple. Right here there were five and right here there were five. So this is the nature of the data, how did the data come in. For this particular example, the average number of moose seen on a plot was 1.8. 1 1.8 1 .8 is the average number of moose. Each plot is one square kilometer, so that means on average there is 1.8 moose per square kilometer. Isle Royal has 523 square kilometers of land, and so if you just do that multiplication, 1.8 moose per square kilometer times 523 square kilometers gives you 941 moose. That's, that's the essential way, essentially the way in which we count moose on Isle Royal, but we do something a little bit fancier. And I want to describe it to you because this slightly fancier technique is, is a very common way to count animals for any kind of population, so I want to describe it in just a little bit of detail. What I have on this map shows with the location of those plots, but in addition to showing the location of the plots, I have different kinds of habitat uh, highlighted. There's this shoreline area, which is shaded in a, in a kind of a, a light shading. There's another area here along the shoreline, and then here and here. This all represents what we'll call medium-density moose habitat. Then there's another area of Isle Royal, basically this interior region, that's all relatively low density. 
And then there's this area here, which is a higher density area of moose habitat. And basically what we know is that from the kind of vegetation that is in each of these three areas of Isle Royale, we generally expect the moose to be of higher densities or lower densities. And so what we do is we, we stratify our accounts. That's a, a kind of a technical term. What we mean by stratification, I'm going to show you just now. These low density habitat types, these areas that are in the middle portion of Isle Royale, the average number of moose that we see on each one of those plots is less than one moose. It's 0 0.6 moose is the average number of moose seen on these plots in the middle of Isle Royale. This middle portion of Isle Royale that's low density of moose represents 180 square kilometers of Isle Royale. So you take 0 0.6 times 180, and that means in the low density areas of Isle Royale, there are 150 moose living in that area. In these areas of medium density moose, these are the shoreline areas here, uh, here, and down in here. These areas we saw in this particular year, 2004, on average 1.9 moose in each of these types of plots. And then this area of Isle Royale, this area of medium density moose, represents about 230 square kilometers. Again, you do the multiplication and you get 441 moose living in these medium density areas. Okay, and then in the high density areas, this area right in here, on the average plot, or the average number of moose that we saw on those plots, it was 3.5 moose. There are 37 square kilometers of Isle Royale that is this high density habitat. If you do that multiplication, you get 130 moose. And so if we focus just on... If we focus just on the, on, the, on the total numbers, that's 152 moose plus 441 moose plus 130 moose. And if you add all that together, you get 723 moose. It's the same data that we used when we did the simpler calculation, the calculation that gave us 941 moose. So it's, it's, it's uh, the same raw data, but because the data is processed in a different way, processed by stratification, stratifying for the different kinds of moose habitat, you get a different number, and this number is almost certainly a more accurate number. And so, what I've just described to you is referred to as a randomized, stratified sampling design. It's stratified by habitat, and on Isle Royale, we, in most years, recognize three different kinds of habitat, low, medium, and high. It's randomized, I put randomized in quotations. If we were doing this uh, plot counts uh, for some other species and if we were going to design that, uh, that sampling procedure today, we would be real careful about making sure the locations of the plots were in fact randomized. We'd use some random procedure to figure out where those plots would be. On Isle Royale, this method of counting was developed long before there was such a thing as randomized stratified sampling designs. And so what happens is that the plots on Isle Royale are, uh, w w were basically selected with an eye to basically knowing where you're at on Isle Royale by being in the plane looking down on the ground. You have to make sure you know whether you're in the plot or out of the plot because the, the plots aren't indicated on the planet. You just have to look down and say, yep, I'm in the plot, so the, the moose that I can see, he counts because he's on the plot. And so there's a lot of geographic boundaries that we use, the edges of lakes, the peak of a mount, a peak of a hilltop or something like this. And so, so it turns out the advantage of these plots maybe not being perfectly randomly situated is, is, is more important than if they had been randomized. So that's why I have randomized in, 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 in quotations there. There are uh, some additional details that I'm not showing you about how it is that we perform that stratification. So just uh, I want to alert you to the fact that that can be a complicated process all by itself. And also the calculations that I offered only give us a sense of what's the expected number of moose or our best guess for the number of moose on Isle Royale. There are also techniques for calculating confidence intervals that would give you a sense of uh, the level of our certainty or how, uns how certain we might be that there are that many number of moose. That can be complicated business, and I don't want to go into that now, but just point out that, that that's important. What I do want to say, though, is something a little bit about the habitat of Isle Royale. And I want to say something about the habitat of Isle Royale because it speaks to the stratification, this notion that some places of Isle Royale are better habitat than others. And I also want to speak about Isle Royale habitat because by, well, by showing you some pictures, it'll give you a sense of what the place looks like. 
And so Isle Royale can be roughly divided, now I'm speaking both geology and, and habitat in, in, in terms of th three basic areas. And they would be a, a western area, a middle area, and an eastern area. The western area, what mainly characterizes it is that it's got really thick soil comparatively now. What happened is that Isle Royale is really the result of glaciation. And so what happened between, oh, seven and four, 14, between seven and 14,000 years ago is that Isle Royale was covered with glaciers. Well, when the glaciers were receding, they rested or paused for a period of time over this west end of Isle Royale. And as they paused there, they deposited lots and lots of soil. That soil is relatively rich. And so trees that do well in rich soils today is what grows there. And those are mostly deciduous trees. And so if you were standing on a hilltop looking at the western end of Isle Royale, this is basically what it looks like. Very complete canopy cover and lots of, uh, lots of deciduous trees, especially lots of maple trees, but also aspen and birch trees are common at this end. The other part of Isle Royale is, uh, that I want to focus attention on now is this eastern end of Isle Royale. And what the eastern end of Isle Royale is characterized is basically where the glaciers retreated very quickly. And where they retreated quickly, they scoured the earth and they did not deposit soil, but instead they left a lot of exposed bedrock. Exposed bedrock is not such a great place for trees to grow. And as a result, the forest canopy is more broken. There are fewer trees there. And the trees that are there are more commonly conifer trees, in particular spruce trees and fir trees, balsam fir trees. Um, and so this kind of habitat, basically what it amounts to is a balsam fir tree is a better food item and, uh, for moose. And that's more common at the east end of the island. And so so the density of moose tends to be a little bit more so there. Then at the western end of the island, where there's more maple trees, and maple is not such a good food item for moose, especially in the wintertime. The other type of, uh, of uh, the other part of Isle Royale to think about is this middle portion of Isle Royale and this portion right here. These are characterized by some forest fires. The biggest forest fire took place in 1936, and so what happens is that uh, the forest today in this part of the island is about 100 years old. The trees that are there now are characterized mostly by 70 or 80, 80 year old birch trees and spruce trees. This is a kind of tree, spruce tree, that moose will not eat at any, kind, at any time of the year. And, and birch trees, moose will eat them uh, during some times of the year. But the thing of it is, is that uh, birch trees, um, of this age, about 70 years old, they're all high and up in the canopy and moose can't really get at the leaves of those trees very well. So what happens is that the middle part of Isle Royale is basically a moose desert, not very moose there at all. Another couple of key features about Isle Royale is that there's an important shoreline effect. That shoreline effect goes in almost a kilometer almost or in the, about a half a mile from the shoreline inland. What happens is, is that Lake Superior is a very cold lake. Even in the summertime, if it's a cold summer, the surface temperature of Lake Superior can be uh, just f maybe 5 degrees centigrade, maybe in the neighborhood of about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, so very cold. It makes the land near the shoreline cold, which makes it more suitable for conifer trees. That's an advantage for the moose. And so if you remember from several Several slides ago, there was a slightly higher density of moose around the shoreline. It's because of that shoreline effect. And then the other thing is, uh, is that moose are also um, uh, very fond of, of wetland areas. I've mentioned that in a previous lecture. And so a lot of Isle Royale uh, are, in fact, comprised of, of wetlands of various different kinds of types. And so, again, what I wanted to uh, do is give you, first of all, just some photographs that show you a little bit of what the landscape of Isle Royale is like. And then also I wanted to kind of uh, make some comparison between, uh, you know, up on this top map, which illustrates where it is that there's high, medium, and low density, and how that corresponds to the information that I've just given you about both the geology and the vegetation of Isle Royale. Now, we're still not done talking about how it is that we count moose. What I've done so far is given you basically kind of a statistical perspective on, on how it is that we count moose. I want to describe to you a little bit about the nuts and bolts, about how that data are actually collected. And, and again, this means from the airplane. So 
what I want to do is, is <coughs> zoom in on one of these particular plots right here, one that's on the northeast end of Isle Royale, and this, this image that we're looking at on the bottom is an aerial photograph of that plot. And so you can see I've got it marked off here. You know, on the, you know, on the Earth it's not marked off, obviously. So when you're flying the airplane, you have to know whether you're in the plot or out of the plot. I've already mentioned that. And you have to have a real systematic way of flying over the island. And so these, this green trajectory is basically a series of nine... Let me clear this here. It's basically a series of nine overlapping circles. And they basically are flown like this. And by flying those nine overlapping circles, you can see every, basically every square inch of that plot from usually several different angles. And that's the best way to see the moose. Of course, we're doing that from an airplane flying at relatively low elevation. It takes about a thousand turns of the airplane, circling of the airplane, in order to count all the moose on the island. So it takes a little bit of a robust stomach to be able to handle all that turning around. And, and so basically the, the pilot's job is to do a few things. The pilot's job is to make sure that we're on the plots and not having accidentally flown off of it. And of course to keep the plane flying, to not, uh, to not crash into the ground while you're t t making all these relatively small circles. And then the observer's job, that's my job, or, or Rolf Peterson, who sometimes is flying, is to keep our eyes glued to the ground, always on the lookout for moose. This is the scene that you see, and what happens is, is that that ground is just rolling past you, rolling beneath the struts of the airplane, and then that, that ski pad, that landing, uh, that landing ski that you can see uh, in the airplane. And so what happens is it's a bit of a mesmerizing affair. It's, the plane is loud, there's a loud hum of, 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 of the engine, and that's all you basically hear at all. And, uh, and then the ground is just rolling by in this rather monotonous fashion, minute after minute after minute. And it becomes basically this very meditative affair because you, you, the tendency, frankly, is to drift asleep. And this is not permitted because if you were to just really, if your eyes closed for just a moment or two, you'd miss a, a moose. There's a moose in this picture, and that's basically what you're looking for. And it, takes, it can take only a second or two between when the moose is visible and when the plane has flown by and a tree has covered it up, and the moose in this image is right here in the center of that red circle. And so a plot may have only one moose on it, and you have to be watching every single second to make sure you don't miss that moose. And so it's, 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 it's frankly, it's not the most exciting thing in the world to count moose. It's, it's a, as I mentioned, it's this kind of mental discipline to always stay focused. And, uh, and what happens is some people are better at counting moose than others. Experience is a great part of it. The more years that you've been counting moose, the better are you, are, you are at it. And... Uh, it can be something that statisticians focus on too. What's your chances of missing a moose? And, and then estimates can be corrected for that. We won't go into that here. Um, what I want to do now is, is shift gears uh, for one of the other things that it is that we measure on Isle Royal. I'd mentioned that for every year, for 50 years, we've counted moose and wolves. Every year since 1971, we've also, counted, we've also estimated the kill rate, which is basically to count how often it is that wolves kill moose. We've mentioned kill rate already in a previous lecture. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about how we, how we estimate it. We're going to see kill rate over and over again throughout this course. And I want to mention again why it is that we talk about it so much. The purpose of the project is to understand how and why it is that the moose and wolf populations fluctuate over time. It's kill rate that connects these two populations. Kill rate is, is a source of food for the wolves. It's a source of mortality for the moose. It's an important component of explaining why the wolf and moose populations fluctuate. So, so to account for that, you have to estimate it or count it. It's a statistic, the kill rate. And the statistic has units, and these are the units. It's the number of kills per wolf per day. And so it can be calculated by just the, the number of kills that you observe that are made by a pack. You divide that by the size of the pack that made those kills, and you divide that again by the observation period, how many days it is that you were watching those wolves. This is data from a particular year. 
Each dot represents uh, uh, the location of a different kill site. And so what you can basically do is you can add up all of the kill sites, add up all of the number of wolves that were making all of these kills, indicated here, six wolves in one pack, three in another, six in another. Divide that by the number of days that we watched for that year, usually a number like around 40 or 45 days, and then you get an estimate. Going back to our notebook, I mentioned that in winter study we have this notebook, and every day that we fly, we keep track of our notes. So this, this is basically how the information evolves in this notebook. There is a, a different row for every day of winter study, and that's indicated by the date right here. There's a different column for each one of the packs that are present that year. This year there was Middle Pack, Chippewa Harbor Pack, Paducah Pack, and East Pack. And what we do, and I know some of this is a little bit difficult to see, but it, just to point it out is fine, is that uh, if we saw the wolves, then what we do, if we saw the wolves and they didn't do anything, then we just draw a straight line. When I say didn't do anything, I mean if they didn't make a kill. We just draw a straight line to indicate that, and that's what's happening there. If we saw them and they made a kill, then we put a little X there, and then we give the kill a number, 0, 0, or I'm sorry, 08-1, the first kill of 2008. If we didn't see them that day, but we were able to maybe on a subsequent day follow their tracks in the snow backward and then confirm that they didn't make any kills, then we'd make a dotted line indicating that we followed their tracks so we know they didn't make a kill on those days. And then there are some occasions for Paducah Pack is a good example right in here is a big area where it was, it was just hard to follow them. It snowed for several days that area. Paducah Pack was a small pack so they don't leave tracks that are very easy for us to detect. Anyways, what we do at the end of winter study is we can just count up how <coughs> all these kills and divide it by however many days that we watch those wolves and then so on and, and make our our estimate of kill rate in that way. And then on the, uh, the right-hand side, you can, you can see an example of, of how we can work all of these numbers and get an estimate. And I guess what I want to emphasize here is that the units of time, they can be calculated in different ways. And so if you calculate kills per wolf per day, the answer you get is a little bit of an abstract number. It's hard to interpret what that number means. Um, 0 0.2, uh, uh, 0.027, it's hard to know what that means. But, uh, but if we scale that up to an entire year, and then we realize, oh, 9.7, let's say we a little intuition can, uh, or a little bit of insight can come from this. We can say, oh, well, this pack may need something like almost 10 moose per year to keep it going. And when you know that on average, there are maybe, well, I shouldn't say on average, in, in this particular year, there were something like 700 moose on Isle Royal. You realize, oh, okay, of the 700 moose on Isle Royal, maybe about 10 of them uh, went to supporting the middle pack. So that's how it is that we estimate kill rate. Every day that we fly in the airplane, you, one of the things that we're doing is we're looking for the wolves, and when we find the wolves, we look to see if they made a kill, and that's what we do with that information. In addition to finding kill sites so that we can estimate how often it is that wolves make these kills, we also perform necropsies on these moose. And the reason that we perform necropsies on these moose is that we want to understand what was the condition of that moose at the time that it died. We want to know, was it a healthy, vigorous moose? And that moose wouldn't have died had wolves not killed it. In which case, the fact that the wolves have killed the moose is a big deal to the moose population. Or, is the moose that was just killed by these wolves, was, did it have something wrong with it? Was it going to die anyways, and the fact that the wolves killed it doesn't matter to the moose population at all. In the extreme case, you can ask yourself the question, are wolves predators in the way that we normally think of, 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 of killing prey? Or are wolves maybe a little bit more like scavengers and they just don't quite wait for their prey to die? They kill them a few days before they're going to die anyways. And if this is the case, then wolves would have relatively little impact on their prey. That's why we perform these necropsies to figure out what was the condition of the moose at the time of its death to figure that out. <clears throat> so to conduct these necropsies, what we do is we wait for the wolves to finish feeding on the moose. And when they leave, then we land the plane 
on the nearest frozen lake. We put on our snowshoes and we hike into where that kill is. Sometimes it's just a few hundred yards to get to the kill. Sometimes it takes all day to get there, maybe many miles. And in the snow, that it can take several hours to travel a couple of miles. Uh, and then we perform a necropsy. And we, and we record literally dozens of pieces of information when we perform these necropsies. And for the moment, what I want to do is show you just a few of the things that we look for when conducting these, these necropsies. One of the things that we look for are signs of arthritis. And so what we see in this image are two hip sockets from different moose. The lower hip socket, and the hips, the, this entire bone, is the pelvis of one moose. And this is the hip socket in particular. And that is a healthy, normal hip socket. There's one that's nothing wrong with it. This one on top, obviously, is, is, is quite different looking. It's got something quite severely wrong with it. That's a severely arthritic hip socket for a moose. The moose that had that hip socket, the, the ball and socket of, the, of that hip joint would have been completely dislocated. Every time the moose would have taken a step, there would have been a really conspicuous, conspicuous limp. And wolves are pretty good at finding moose that have these troubles. So good at finding moose like this is that there are, are good reasons to think that a moose can go from a perfectly healthy hip socket to one that has very severe arthritis like this in less than a year. And so moose don't live with this problem very long before it is that, that wolves find them and, and kill them. An another uh, thing that we look for is something called jaw necrosis. And necrosis just refers to dying away of tissue. And in, the, and in this uh, uh, image, we have two mandibles or jaw bones of a moose. The one at the bottom is, is a normal and healthy jaw bone. These are the teeth right here. Over on the left-hand side is the front part of the jaw, like right in here. And over here on the, on, on the right-hand side, that's the back part of the jaw, like right in here. And then what we have up here is, is, a, is a moose jaw that's got something really quite seriously wrong with it. And, and basically what's happening is this. When moose get old, which is about the age of nine, then what happens is that their teeth loosen up. And when their teeth loosen up, remember they eat twigs in the wintertime. And when their teeth loosen up, they can get twigs stuck between their teeth. And well, moose, well, they don't floss, and so the twigs stay there. And then they get infected, and well, moose don't take antibiotics, so the infection just grows and gets worse and worse. Literally rots away at the jawbone. I, I saw a, a case once, not in moose, but in elk, where the mandible actually was broken in half. So if we can go back to the picture for just a minute. What happened is this infection got so bad right at this location that the mandible broke into two separate pieces. That was an extreme case, but, it, but actually the case that we're looking at here it happens, it happens pretty often. Here's the thing is, is if you've ever had a toothache, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've ever had a toothache, y you know that the only kind of food that you want would be like cottage cheese and yogurt and stuff like that. Moose don't have a chance to do that. They have to keep, in the wintertime, continuing to eat twigs, small sticks and chewing on them. Well, a moose that has a problem like this is going to greatly favor the side of their jaw that doesn't have that trouble, but they're not going to be able to chew their food as well. They're going to be more prone to malnutrition, and so they're just not going to be as well off. And so wolves are pretty good at finding moose that have this trouble. When we perform a necropsy in the wintertime, you know, where, where you have to go through and we're, we're walking through really thick forest vegetation looking for the necropsy. I know where it is on a map because we saw it from the airplane and I could put a dot on the map. But finding the location of the dot on the map uh, on, and actually somewhere on Isle Royal, it can take a little challenge. So you have to walk around and hike around looking for the spot. You look for clues like the wolf tracks are going in this area. Well, one of the things that happens is that it's, it's just a 900 or 1,000 pound animal that's just died. It's, it's slowly rotting. Even though it's, it's cold outside at refrigeration type temperatures, it still smells of, of rotting flesh and blood and this sort of a thing. So you can sometimes smell the carcass before you get there. But here's the thing. Even though you can smell this rotting flesh, you can smell jaw necrosis 
before you even get up to it. Because jaw necrosis is basically an infection. If you've ever had a, a flesh wound that becomes infected, a uh, bacterial infection, you know that it smells a little bit funky. Well, that, that's basically what's happening here. Here's the point, is that if I can smell with my really pathetic human nose the bacteria associated with this jaw necrosis, you better believe that a wolf can smell it. And here's the thing, a wolf can almost certainly smell jaw necrosis in a moose before it even sees a moose. And so wolves end up being pretty good at finding uh, moose that have this trouble. When it's all said and done with, about half of all of the moose that we perform necropsies on have something kind of significant wrong with them, like arthritis or jaw necrosis. And, and of course, we're discovering that when all that we have left to look at are the bones that have been left behind by the wolves. Uh, you can imagine a lot of things could be wrong with the moose that would be difficult for us to detect. Well, anyways... In all of the years that we've been uh, uh, conducting winter study and all of the summer work that we do, we collect the c bones from carcasses of about 100, 130 moose per year. Over the last five decades, we've performed necropsies on more than 4,500 different moose. These bones have become a remarkable source of information all by themselves. And, uh, and we're going to see that throughout the, uh, the lectures that are coming up. And so, uh, yeah, just, just to point out that the bones themselves have been a, a, a real great source of information. So, so we've been talking about um, the things that we learn mostly at winter study. S some of the things that we learn at winter study, we, we do more of the same during the summertime. We learn some different things during the summertime as well. But, but, but winter study, because it's been going on for so long and because it's been being done in the same way for so many years, it's become a, a, a kind of a popular interest for, for, for people in the general public. There is a woman whose name is Nevada Barr. She is a murder mystery novelist. She came to winter study a few years ago and she wrote a novel, uh, a, a fictionalized murder mystery, if you will, but it was all based on what life is like at Winter Study. She named the book Winter Study. It was on the New York Times bestseller list. If you're interested in, in murder mysteries, you, you might enjoy this book. Also, we have a, a, a series of publications called Winter Study, Notes from the Field. And these are basically daily journal entries that are, are, are published on the Internet every day during Winter Study, saying what it is that we've learned and how we learn these things, and kind of details the daily drama of, of, of these wolves. Uh, tens of thousands of people follow this, and every year after they're published on the web page, they're bound into a little booklet. You can find that on Amazon.com if you're interested in buying a copy of it. And... Uh, uh, and so what I want to do, you know, this just gives you evidence that people are interested in, in what life at winter study is, is like. And so I'll describe that now. It's mostly about two things. It's about that airplane and it's about the weather. And they kind of go together because you can't fly the airplane in any kind of weather. First of all, just the airplane. It's a wilderness situation. There's no backup support. There's no hangar to put the airplane in. There's no mechanic there. The only mechanic there is the pilot, who, who, who is a mechanic. But the point is, is that he has to be entirely responsible for everything working well on that airplane. Our, our, our lives depend on it. And you, if something needs to be fixed or maintained, there isn't a warm room to go into and fix it. It has to be done there right, right on the ice. What we see in, in, this, in the picture that's being shown here is, is just a, what has to be done every morning, which is just to preheat the airplane. It takes about 45 minutes to do so. You've got to stand outside while you uh, basically direct heat with a propane tank propane tank is right right here and then it just throws hot air uh, into that plane so if it's 20 below you gotta stand outside for about 45 minutes and wait for that thing to warm up and so uh, the pilot is 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 just a really critical part of the whole operation he is, if you like, an extension of our senses. Because when we're flying across the island, and if, for example, you say turn left because you want to see something that's over to the left, you say, oh, no, 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 not that far left, a little bit less left. Well, that is, that's going to be a little bit frustrating. He has to almost read your mind to know what it is that you'd like to see, how high up you'd like to be, how fast you'd like to be flying, this sort of a thing. 
uh, he knows as much about the wolves as, as, as we do in terms of making observations about them, trying to figure out where they're at when we can't find them and all that sort of thing. Don Glazer is, uh, is, a, is a real critical part of the project. And he's been flying for the project for the last 25 years. The other important part about the project is the weather. Everything we do is dictated by the weather. Because what we want to do is fly every daylight hour that's possible. Two things keep us out of the sky. One is high winds. If there are high winds, it just causes the plane to be, flown, uh, to be blown around and jostled and, 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 and bumped around too much. And we're trying to fly basically as slow as possible and to fly circles and to fly as low as we can over the trees so that we can have a good sight of, of, of what it is that we're looking for. And wind basically just makes that dangerous. So if it's too windy, we can't fly. What we see in this image right here is just snow being lifted up off of the surface of a frozen lake, obscuring the visibility. So it's just an indication of the snow. We're constantly studying weather maps, uh, trying to gauge when is the next uh, bit of snow going to, to come by, when is the next storm going to happen. Everything, you know, we're right here, and we'd be interested in watching that system right there. Is it going to develop? Is it going to dissipate? Is it going to go south? south of us, north of us, we spend a great deal of time looking at weather maps. Because Isle Royal can go from this, this is a satellite image of Isle Royal uh, taken in the wintertime. The lake on this particular image is still, has not frozen, it's still liquid water, that's why it's so dark. These are just light bands of clouds, these are nothing. Easy to fly through, those would be relatively high in elevation, that would be pretty, pretty easy stuff. But Isle Royal can go like that to this in a matter of hours. Basically what this is, is just a strong northwest wind, and that strong northwest wind is making lake effect snow. If that catches us, uh, we, we have to land almost immediately. So what it means is you have to land back at base camp before it happens. And so, when the weather starts to look like this, it's time to come home, and, uh, and well, at least wise, there's a, we'd always prefer to be flying, but there's a lot of things to do at home. There's usually four, five, six people at winter study, and uh, we're on our own, and we have to f figure out all the things necessary to keep us alive and comfortable and that sort of a thing. A, a few things. We live in a cabin. The cabin has wood heat. Water comes from a hole in the ice. That's what this picture is, is, is illustrating, is, uh, is the hole that we've knocked into the ice, and, and then we just dig water out of there. Uh, there's no showers, so we just clean up by taking a sauna. Uh, there's just an outhouse. That's the chilliest part of the affair, probably, is, is just using an outhouse all winter long. Um, and, and so anyways, lots of chores to do around just to kind of uh, you know, keep things going that way. When we collect these bones, they still have a bit of flesh on them. They still need to be processed, because the next... You know, basically where these bones are going to go eventually is a museum uh, where they're stored, so they have to be uh, prepared. Well, the ba basic way of preparing them is to boil them. So we have a big propane uh, burner, basically, and that propane burner sits underneath a garbage can and, uh, and is just boiling away all this water. We throw the bones in there, and you've got to tag the bones so we know which bone went with which moose, and you can't cook them for too long or they can become ruined, basically. And so each bone has its own recipe uh, about being boiled for not too long or but not too little and that sort of a thing. Um, also, we collect genetic samples at winter study. The genetic samples come from scats of wolves. So when we go to a kill site, we, uh, in addition to collecting some bones and performing a necropsy, we also collect all of the scats that we can find from the wolves because we can use that to get what's basically a DNA fingerprint. It'll allow us to tell one wolf from another. Brothers and sisters can be told apart. Parents and offspring can be told apart. All of this sort of thing. When we, when we collect the scats, it's just a, you know, it's basically a giant wolf scat in a Ziploc bag. It has to be processed a little bit while we're at winter study. This is a picture of, of Leah Vucetich. This is my wife and also a full partner in the project. She leads our genetic studies. And so here she is uh, preparing some of those samples where they'll get stored in a, in a deep freezer until we analyze the genetics. There's always something at winter study that is broken and has to be repaired. It's cold, and uh, cold is difficult on equipment. And so there's always just something to be fixed. So there's, there's never a dull moment. There's always something to do. Um, you know, one of the things that's important about winter study... Oh, I have to fix something. I think I have a problem here on my slides. This will take just one second, if you don't mind.
Okay, here we are. And so anyways, um, th these basic activities have, have gone on in, in largely the same way every year for the last 50 years. And so here's a picture of some people at Winter Study at the years 1965. The fellow on the left, his name is Derwood Allen. We'll learn about him uh, more in just a little bit. He's the fellow who started the project. And, uh, you know, here we are in the year 2008. It's the same thing. It's, it's just a small group of people whose lives are all pretty tightly connected for these two months. And uh, here's another picture taken in the year 1965, filling up the airplane. And in the year 2008, we had kind of a special treat. The grandson of the first pilot, the first pilot on the project, his name was Don Murray. He's right here in 1965. His grandson is named Don Murray Jr. And he has the same plane that his father grew up in. And here you have, you know, 50 years later almost, the same airplane. It's so much of this is, is, is really based on technology that's been around for a long time. And so anyways, there's a, a lot of interesting history associated with the project. And that's winter study. The main focus, of course, though, is to understand how it is that we collect data there. And what we're going to talk about in our next lecture, to give you just a little preview right now, is that from winter study, we've counted how many wolves and moose there are. Now what we're going to do in, this, in the next lecture um, is, is, is look at that data look at those fluctuations in wolves and moose and, and try to provide some explanation for all of that. So uh, that's all for now. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and we'll see you during the next lecture. Goodbye now.